Now, it's all very fine to think about the different types of urinary tract infections, but really that's not really that important. What we really need to know is how to identify a urinary tract infection, how to decide whether it's an upper lower, upper urinary tract or a lower urinary tract, and what treatment we need to give. So the next few slides are going to uh, help us understand this a little more. We're looking at what the clinical presentation could be. But again, remember, this is notorious in medicine that clinical presentation many a time does not always fit in a particular pattern. But this is the general clinical expect, uh, presentation that we expect in a unity tract infection. So looking at urethritis, that is the in inflammation of the urethra alone. So the patient will have dysuria, usually burning or discomfort. They have frequency of urination and there will be pyuria. And if you examine them clinically, you will find urethral tenderness. The next lower urinary tract infection is prostatitis. And uh, this can be a very severe situation. Patients are very uncomfortable and this can often be a very dangerous situation, can lead on to a life-threatening situation. So here the symptoms would be fever with chills. They will have dysuria, perineal or discomfort in the testicular region. They might have low back pain and they will have urinary obstructive symptoms. So what we call LUTS or lower urinary tract symptoms, where they'll have a poor stream, they will have to strain, they'll have urgency, they'll have hesitancy, they have to strain, they have to run to the toilet if they, they feel like passing urine. So these are all the symptoms of lower urinary tract prostatitis infections. Clinically, the prostate will be tense and it will be extremely tender, but then you will have to do a rectal examination to really understand it. And nowadays, Rectal examination is uh, more redundant and it's not practiced regularly because not only is it painful, it also doesn't give you a definitive diagnosis and it is not, uh, it could also worsen things by spreading infection into the bloodstream. So what we do nowadays is uh, it is much easier to do it and you get much more information. Trust stands, stands for transrectal ultrasound. So that's about prostatitis. Now this thing about low back pain, we always expect that you have low back pain in a pyelonephritis. Whenever we talk of low back pain related to urinary tract infection, we say it is used, it's more common with pyelonephritis. But don't forget, even cystitis, even a bladder infection can produce low back pain because of the referred pain syndrome. Cystitis is inflammation or infection of the urinary bladder. The symptoms are very typical. There will be suprapubic pain and tenderness. There will be frequency, dysuria, 30% of them have got hematuria and there'll be a cloudy or foul smelling urine along with the dysuria and the frequency. Signs would be a tender urethra and suprapubic tenderness. Going up to the upper tract, acute pyelonephritis, patients will present with a very dramatic presentation. They will be having fever, they will be shaking, shivering, they'll have nausea, vomiting, they might have diarrhea, especially if it's an enteric bacteria which is causing the UTI and they will have, they may or may not have symptoms of cystitis. And clinically, they will have the classic fever pattern. They will have tachycardia, they have renal angle tenderness, the abdomen would be tender and tense. And sometimes there may be signs of gram-negative sepsis in the sense they might have tachycardia, their blood pressure might uh, reduce, and uh, they might have respiratory distress as well because of acidosis. So, how do we diagnose it? Now that we have a clinical presentation which will guide us towards which part of the urinary tract is involved, whether it's an upper or lower, and which part of upper or lower, how do we diagnose it further? How do we move forward and confirm our diagnosis? The first step, obviously, is to do a urine analysis. A urine analysis is considered the poor man's kidney biopsy because you can get lots and lots of information from a simple urine examination. The first thing we look at if you're suspecting a urinary tract infection is the WBCs per high power field. Anything more than five is significant, but usually in high grade urinary tract infections, the WBC count is usually more than 50 per high power field. RBCs will be there. General, in general, they're less than three. So anything more than three is significant. If the organism is proteus, which splits the urea, or the, it's a urea splitting organism, there the urine pH will be alkaline. But most of the time, the normal urinary pH is acidic, usually less than 5.5. So if it's alkaline urine and you're suspecting a UTI, proteus is a possible, possible cause of the UTI. 
Nitrides are a very specific test for confirming a urinary tract infection. It is not sensitive, but it's very specific. And uh, the, though the sensitivity is nearly 90 to 80 percent, the specificity is around 25 to 30. So if you have nitride positive, there's a very high likelihood that you have a urinary tract infection. Leukocyte esterase is an enzyme produced by WBCs, and it will be a high level in those who have got high WBCs in the urine. So it's not a very sense, not a very specific test. It's sensitive, but it's not very specific. And we do stains to look for bacterial, so gram stain, fungus, fungal smears, and AFP stain to look for AFP. WBC casts and bacterial casts are pathognomonic of acute pyelonephritis. So if you see WBC casts, you're likely dealing with pyelonephritis. Many a time, stone disease can cause urinary tract infection, and the common causes of stones are uric acid, oxalate, and calcium. So if you get uric acid or oxalate crystals in the urine, and they have a urinary tract infection, there's a likelihood that you'll be having a stone somewhere. So you need to evaluate further for stones and do the tests particular to that. The most important test to confirm a urinary tract infection is a urine culture. And this is the gold standard to diagnose the urinary tract infection. And remember the first slide, earlier slide that I put talking about the significant bacteria without symptoms, with symptoms, the colony count in suprapubic aspirations and the colony count in catheter samples. So these are the methods we use to get cultures, samples. But if, you're, if you don't have the facility of a suprapubic or a catheter, then you have to do a midstream clean catch. So basically in a midstream clean catch, if it's a male, you clean the external genitalia with soap and water, they start passing urine. The first 5 to 10 ml is the urethral urine, and that is contaminated by the skin bacteria like Staph epidermidis and Saprophyticus. So those, that part should be discarded. And in midstream, we collect that represents the, represents the bladder and the upper tract. And the end stream, again, needs to be discarded. For ladies, the best way to do it is to sit on the toilet facing the other way, not facing the normal way because that supports the thighs and that helps them to clean the labia with soap and water and facilitates midstream collection. Prostatic massage is not done anymore. It used to be done in the earlier days, but uh, nowadays because prostatic massage one is painful and it can also spread, cause hematogenous spread of uh, prostatic infection and abscesses and cause sepsis and septic shock, it's not done anymore. Now we're in our clinical practice, many a time we come across a situation where we have persistently the patient has got WBCs in the urine. You go on culturing it, but every time the culture is negative. And there are certain reasons for that. There are certain scientific reasons for that. And it's important that we know these reasons of uh, what we call sterile pyuria, where you have WBCs in the urine, but the culture is sterile. It's important to know because that will help you avoid unnecessary treatment for a lot of patients who have got no UTI, but have got sterile pyuria. But certain things have to be definitely ruled out. For example, if it's a UTI which is existing and has not been treated properly, then you will not be able to grow anything on the culture. Or the patient is already on antibiotics and you do the culture, they're probably going to be sterile. So this, the background history needs to be noted. Renal tuberculosis, again, will have persistent pyuria, but will not grow any bacteria when you do the culture. So somebody who's got persistent pyuria, who's losing weight, who's got B symptoms, these people who've been exposed to TB in the past, these people definitely need to try and rule out uh, genital urinary tuberculosis. Fungal infections, again, many a time will present with sterile pyuria. But this is what we expect anyway. What are the other things which can cause WPCs in the urine without infection? Acute interstitial nephritis because of some drug allergy or some, some other thing can cause uh, WPCs in the urine without a definitive infection. Corticosteroids, Pregnancy itself can cause WBCs in the urine. Renal calculi can, can be existing without infection, but can produce WBCs. And those who had a kidney transplant or those who are on cyclosporin can also present with sterile pyuria. Going further with the diagnosis, once you've decided that you have a urine culture positive, you've documented the organism, you, you've proved that it is not sterile pyuria, you need to find out whether there are any complications of the urinary tract. You need to find out whether any complications of the urinary tract infection itself and how the urinary tract is of that particular patient to ensure 
that you don't get these these infections frequently because if there's an abnormal urinary tract infection, urinary tract, you treat the infection, it goes away, then it's either going to uh, come back or relapse or a reinfection is going to happen. So whenever somebody has got a urinary tract infection, you must rule out any other complications either before the infection causing the some complication causing the infection or post infection leading to other complications like abscesses so for that we have to do imaging x-ray will look for any we can look for any calculi ultrasound will tell you if there are any abscesses if there's hydronephrosis or if there's polycystic kidney disease because polycystic kidney disease can predispose to urinary infections uh, MCUG needs to be done to rule out reflux because reflux is another cause of frequent urinary infections which can later lead on to renal failure and dialysis. On a plain CT scan is a very good indicator. If you see perinephric fat stranding on CT abdomen, you should think about giving of treating it as an acute pyelonephritis rather than just a lower urinary tract infection. IVP will tell you about the anatomy of the urinary tract. And this picture shows you a uh, general IVP. There's nothing, this is all normal. This is how the renal pelvis looks. The minor and the major calyces, the ureter, left ureter is nice and clean. There's no obstruction there. And you can see the dye which is going from the kidneys into the ureter and into the bladder. So this is a normal IVP. Going further down in the diagnosis, you can do nuclear, medical, um, nuclear medicine scans. You can tag leukocyte tag scans to see the focus of the infection. For example, if there's an abscess somewhere, it will show up on these leukocyte or these gallium or leukocyte tag scans. A DMSA will help you decide whether there are scars in the kidney. And if there are scars, there's likelihood of them being chronic. So they can, it's labeled as chronic pyelonephritis and scars in the kidney form a nidus for infection, and they might have frequent infections because of these scars. So that will also help you to prognosticate and understand how aggressive you have to be with treatment of a particular urinary tract infection. Cystoscopy and retrograde pyelography is also done to understand the whole urinary tract. So it's not as simple as somebody has got a urinary tract infection, you treat it and forget about it. No, you once somebody, you suspect somebody having a urinary tract infection, you need to evaluate them further to understand why they got it so that that will help you decide how aggressive to be with the treatment and how to follow them up and how to set right the underlying problem so that they don't get recurrent urinary tract infections in the future. Because if they get recurrent urinary tract infections in the future, they're likely to have renal dysfunction and get into more problems further down the line. 